Uh, so welcome everybody. So this session is about mutual aid, the future of mutual aid, and the idea of um, what Angela and I certainly call neighborhood democracy. How would we have power and control in neighborhoods in a kind of future vision of our society? Um, and so we have a very simple plan. I'm going to say a few words and then Selva's going to say a few words and then Jack's going to say a few words and then we're going to try and facilitate some kind of question or discussion and we're going to finish at two o'clock. Again, a reminder for any last people who joined us, this is being recorded, will be put online um, shortly. All right. Um, and yes, remember to mute yourself if you can um, uh, until you're speaking. All right. So I run a think tank based in Sheffield called the Centre for Welfare Reform, and my name is Simon Duffy. Um, I've come at this from a few angles, but one of them is that actually the things that the centre really believes in are, is the notion that everybody is a citizen, that everybody has something to give, uh, that everybody can make a difference, and that we need each other. We need everybody, in fact. So that's kind of like our philosophical position. Um, a lot of our work has been focused on the way in which the welfare state, um, which is a brilliant thing, but is often designed in ways that don't make that happen. So we've been trying to reform the welfare state or offer suggestions about how we might reform it. The term welfare reform is, of course, a bit... Um, dangerous because the right use it as code for destroying the welfare state. And um, so that's my opinion. But um, so we don't mean destroy the welfare state. We mean make it a lot better um, and fill it full of citizens and, and make it accountable to citizens. So that's where uh, kind of like our beliefs come from and a lot of our work comes from. One of the things that happened when we, we founded the Centre for Welfare Reform in 2009, and then we were hit by austerity. And one of the things that I suppose I really felt like changed inside my mind was a realisation that um, the welfare state was much more fragile than we realised, and that its fragility was, you could call it constitutional, that it was that there was no resistance. All the charities went, uh, oh, this is a bit sad, but can you keep giving us money? And uh, all the political parties basically bailed out of really challenging it, uh, challenging the things that were happening. And, and I suppose I ended up feeling that um, the problems of the welfare state were ultimately about the way our political system wasn't prepared to defend social justice in a way. Uh, it, it, the whole thing had become far too compliant, far too top down and everybody going, yes, sir. Uh, and, and tugging the forelock really at the system. Even people who officially were opposed to what was going on were not really organizing any resistance to what was going on. And so the center's interest started to become more and more about constitutional reform. But given our interest in citizenship, uh, we were really interested in how people could have power in their neighborhoods, like, um, that's what a democracy means. Uh, democracy in ancient Athens was people in their neighbourhoods deciding things, doing things, uh, not just voting for people who would get, get on a train to London to make decisions on our behalf. Um, and in my city of Sheffield, I started to ask the question, why doesn't Sheffield have a democratic constitution? Why don't we make decisions for ourselves? Why don't we take back power from London? And why don't we move power down to neighbourhoods? In Sheffield, there are 142 neighbourhoods. We've got a population of half a million, more than half a million, and 142 neighbourhoods. And yet there is no democratic forum for any of those neighbourhoods at all. Not one. So effectively, the whole of the city is being governed by what is like a rather dysfunctional parish council that's supposedly meant to represent the interests of over half a million people and certainly doesn't get engaged those people. And so turnout is poor, 
There's a lot of party politics that doesn't seem to go anywhere, a lot of infighting and no real democratic feeling to, to a city which is full of talented, wonderful people who care about the city. So you've got this strange paradox. Um, I I'd, I'd sometimes tell people, look at Iceland. Iceland has a population of 300,000, which is, you know, a lot less than Sheffield. It has a constitution, a president, a parliament, a judiciary, 78 municipalities, which have devolved power. Yeah, so where people can make their own decisions about their own neighbourhood. That's a modern society with a modern welfare state. Our society is broken, centralised, crazy. I was very lucky a few years ago to be asked um, to work in Barnsley, which is just up the road from Sheffield. If you if you don't know where Barnsley is, which you should do, but uh, Barnsley are an example of a local authority. I think who are trying to do things differently, and we wrote a report about that. But you know, the the chief executive of sorry, the council leader in Barnsley, I think put his finger on it really well. He said, you know, what we try to do in these reforms, which are about moving power down, still kind of very top down exercise to be fair, but nevertheless with a lot of integrity, um, is we were trying to build on the fact that people have pride about where they live. They care about where they live, and that's what we need to work with. So um, Angela, who's on the call with me, uh, we're interested in developing this movement for neighbourhood democracy. And at the beginning of the kind of COVID period, um, I, I was talking to Cormac Russell, who's been a big um ideas leader around this field and um, we were kind of talking about the way in which these mutual aid groups could offer us maybe a picture of what it is that we need to do so i'd be really interested to hear what Sel selva and and jack say i think it's very early days but clearly some of you are already starting to organize and think differently about the future so that's what this conversation's about so um hopefully that's okay and Selva, are you happy to go next? So, yes. So I'm Selva and I'm from the Berry Mutual Aid. And what we've noticed um, during this second uh, wave of, of the coronavirus is that actually we've been a lot less busy. People don't seem to be um, requiring as much help as in the first wave. Um, requests have picked up, but they're nowhere near what they were last time. And in a way, that's been good because actually we're also down on volunteers compared to last time. So people have gone back to work. Um, and obviously we don't want the volunteers who are left to suffer from burnout. Um, I'm just trying to, sorry, I'm not very professional. I need to look at my notes. Um, yeah, and, and what we've also noticed within the Berry community is that there seems to be a growing sense of apathy on in, in the um, people and, you know, that sort of initial, yes, let's help uh, enthusiasm has definitely waned this time round. Anyway, well, in the meanwhile, we have, uh, we conducted a winter planning session. So we hosted a session uh, a couple of weeks ago where we invited as many organizations in the Berry area as possible and the community in general to come together to talk about um, the, the sort of the plans, how we can get through the winter with COVID and isolation. Um, and nobody from the community turned up but we did get a fair few um organizations coming which was really good so we had a really good discussion about the types of help that is out there already um how we can then pool our resources together uh how we can um sort of avoid duplication and and then the, the kinds of things that we've noticed that the community uh, maybe that they're worried about, um, you know, such things as digital exclusion, um, advice on maybe finance 
benefits, uh, unemployment, and of course, mental health was very high up on that list. So we collated all that data. We are in the middle of, um, we're going to feedback on the, the data that we um, collected and we're going to have another session where we're hoping to talk about what we found and, and possible ways of how we can maybe start to address some of that. Um, now at the same, almost at the same time, another group in Berry did the same thing. So they also got together and had a session of which I actually helped facilitate, which was good because then I knew what was said in that meeting and I knew what was said in the meeting that we had. And what we've done is we've come up with a live document. Uh, we call it Berry Live and it's there for us to put all our resources, who's where, what's available, and it can be edited at any time, it can be added to at any time. We've got a question and answer section. So if somebody doesn't know something, they put the question in, someone can answer it. And we've opened that up to all organizations in the Berry area, including the council and our local CVS. Um, who have, are on board with this and they may also be able to help things like potential bids and um, funding and, and other kinds of things. Sorry about my son. Um, the second thing that we've done is we formed an alliance with the Elephant's Trail, which I'm part of as well, which is a little berry organisation. Kind Berry, which is a movement and um, Radcliffe Market, which is a co-op. And what we've done is we are forming a slow shopping experience. So we're trying to take in, um, in mind all those people who maybe have digital exclusion, so they can't do online shopping, but they're isolating. At the same time, they don't need to be referred to the food banks, which is what we found happened a lot. They were just isolating the, the, you know, they could afford to pay for their shopping. So what we're doing is we're setting up a, a way where we have volunteer call handlers. They will take the person's food order on the telephone. There's going to be no rush. There's going to be lots of opportunities for the person to chat if, if they want to. So hopefully there's a little bit of um, combating maybe the isolation and the loneliness in there. And the hope that perhaps while they're chatting, other things might come up so we can maybe then signpost them to other services that perhaps they need. Um, and so it will take their order. It will be processed. So we will be using the stall hold, the people stalls on the market and all the other local shops and local businesses, thereby trying to support them as well. Um, so we're doing it as sort of ecologically, ethically, food, you know, local as local as possible. Um, so it will start as a voluntary thing. And if it takes off, we're actually hoping that we might end up getting some paid jobs out of it as well. Thereby try, yeah, not, you know, it's not gonna be a huge number of jobs, but doing our little bit. So the shopping will then be delivered by um, a DBS checked driver who may even be able to put the shopping away for the person if they are not able to do it themselves. Um, we're also, there will be a small fee, but that will be waived for those people that maybe really, you know, need some help. We're also thinking of ways, um, perhaps asking people to voluntarily add maybe 50p to their total so that we can then use that towards other things that maybe other people need. Um, we're also um, liaising with the Radcliffe Food Bank who are going to refer people that they think don't actually need the food bank but could come to us and we're actually going to sort of liaise both ways. Um, so that's, yeah, so that's the second thing we've got. Let me see. Um, I've now talked. I'm talking out of the order that I've written everything down. 
Um, oh yes, and the other thing is, now we had a little while ago, I'm not sure how many of you were attended the last mutual aid um, event that we had in Manchester. Um, and I spoke there and we were talking about the challenges and the one challenge we very mutual aid had was was the terrible trouble we had with our local CVS and Berry Council who just didn't want to know us. We have had an olive branch we're hoping from the CVS who have said that they want to meet with us and actually that meeting is later today so sort of watch this space and we're hoping that maybe we can work together so that's that's the, the hope. Um, my, my personal concern is that they're going to want us to become constituted, which is something we spoke about, but we decided not to, because we like the way that we are free to sort of just get on with it. We don't have to ask anybody. We just, we just do it. Where we are a bit concerned that the CVS won't have anything to do with us unless we're constituted, but let's see what happens. Um, and the last thing, I just had a message. We had a homeless man contact us yesterday and we have now managed to find him temporary accommodation and he will be at the top of the Berry Council list for, for a home. And uh, that is where we're up to at the moment. So that's brilliant. Thank you so much. And so now, Jack, um, um, would you be happy to go next? Yeah, I can do. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Um, and thanks, Simon. Uh, and thanks, Elva. Um, I, I thought, um, well, sorry, my name's Jack. Um, uh, I live in uh, Wally Range in the south of Manchester. Um, and I um, help to run the Wally Range uh, mutual aid group. Um, I thought what I'd do is talk a little bit about what we've what's been happening mostly what's been happening on my street rather than what's happening across the ward um because that's where as i'll explain most almost all of our efforts are focused um and i think i'd be really interested to have this discussion about what it means in terms of um democracy neighbor a uh, neighborhood level because to be honest like it's not something that we uh, had thought about in terms of what we do on a day to day but i think it's a really interesting concept and the, when i was starting to think about what i was going to say for this i was like oh yeah okay there are some opportunities here and there's some really interesting stuff going on so um i'll try and uh just say very quickly what we've been doing um what we hope to be doing in the next few weeks and months and then um it'll be great to chat a bit about it um so um basically um as uh, as many people are, are aware kind of um, we set up our street group on our literally on our street for um, for uh, it's about it's about like there's about 200 people in living in close proximity it was terraced housing um, and that was set up in um, in March in response to everything going on um, the big kind of realization that suddenly everyone's a bit vulnerable and that everyone might need a bit of help um, uh, with basic stuff and I think there was a lot of emphasis on the, the kind of going out and getting shopping and uh, getting uh, pharmaceutical supplies and that kind of stuff for um, uh, people who are self-isolating so uh, myself and my partner we set up this group it was a it's, it's a whatsapp group we told our neighbors we were like look things are going to be tricky um, uh, let's all get together let's everyone join this group and then if you we use this group to support each other you know if someone needed help with whatever they could shout and we would sort it. Um, and it was, it's mutual aid, which as far as I'm concerned, that means everyone supporting each other. Um, it's about solidarity and it's not about charity. It's about, we're all um, here and we're all helping each other. It's not one group of people over here who are you know happy, healthy volunteers going out to help the vulnerable or the people who have need. It's, it's everyone mucking and in and everyone coming in together. Um, and and so we we got the word out on the mostly word of mouth right because you see your neighbors all the time but we posted a flyer through every door um we asked people to stick the flyers in the windows and we grew and grew our group and our group is it's not everyone but it's about like like i don't know like about 70 80 percent of all of the neighbors on this terrace street in 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 the south of manchester um and it's a big old mix and it's a lovely group we've done um, at a Wally Range level, so Wally Range is a ward in the south of Manchester, it's about 12,000 people or something like that. Um, it was very simple. Uh, we created a Facebook group and we said, 
we've done a street group, you should go and do the same thing. Um, and we encouraged um, neighbors to, to, to create a, a, a WhatsApp group. Um, the Facebook page or Facebook group itself had like, you know, this is how you do it. And it had a template for a, a, a leaflet and it had a spreadsheet with the links to, if you want to join your local street group, click on this link and it will take you to it. And we continue to use that group to spread news and to spread information and, hey, this is a useful project or there's some funding or that kind of stuff. But to be honest, it's very, very little goes on at that big, heavy ward level. Our interest was keeping things manageable, keeping things safe and keeping things friendly. And that meant to us sticking to the neighbors on the street. And so that's what we've been doing. That's what we've been focusing all of our efforts and energy. And it's been fantastic. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure other people on the call, probably most of the people, on, I don't know, like may, many people, I, I feel a little bit embarrassed talking about this because it is literally just a WhatsApp group amongst our neighbors. Um, and, and many of you might be in a similar group for yourselves. And obviously, um, as Selva was saying, certainly in the first few months, there's a lot of excitement and energy and, and what have you. But that it continues to be a very positive place and it continues to be a very useful and interesting and active forum, even now in the doldrums of November and December and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so like, you know, I, I, was trying to, I was trying to make a list of what the kind of stuff we did, you know, because I think the focus on originally on mutual aid was about the kind of COVID um, stuff around like helping um, uh, people to self-isolate. And, you know, there was a bit of running errands, running to the shops and, and you know, getting shopping and helping a couple of people with pick up their, farm, their, their, their supplies. And that was essential stuff. And it continues to be essential stuff, but like mostly it's conversations about the bins and it's conversations about um, local news. It's sorting out, um, um it's wishing people happy birthday um it's a lot of the kind of like you know keeping people's spirits up um it's also about very small scale sharing so people share tools and people share plants and people um offer you know items to recycle um it's also about helping people we've helped people with a query for a landlord um about a troublesome landlord we had uh, someone get in touch with uh issue around benefits a number of people have were really worried about furlough and whether or not they were eligible and in some cases we were able to link them to someone on the street who is a you know works in the dwp or or um who, who is a lawyer um or we were able to signpost them to the kind of services that you know i don't know for some people it's obvious go to citizens advice but for others that's not necessarily the case and we were able to put them in touch with people to to, to sort their stuff out um so there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of helping going on. Um, see you, know I mean? um, uh, But I think what what I'm particularly passionate about is we're starting as a community to think about some projects that we're doing together. So um, uh, we it's a, it's a residential street, but for some reason we get through traffic. I don't know. I think it's a glitch in the Google algorithm or something ridiculous where the drivers shave off a minute by coming down our tiny little road. But we get a lot of uh, speeding cars, in particular, young lads coming down um, in, in the evening. And so um, we're starting to organize about how we can do that. We've organized we organized a road closure. We're going to do that more regularly now. And we're in touch with the councillors. And when we get in touch with the councillors, we're no longer just one person complaining about it. We're like a neighborhood of 80 people saying, like, this is not on. And so we've managed to get them around the table and, 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 and um, uh, have some pretty good discussions about where we're going next. Um, we've also opened a community garden. We got in touch with uh, the church on the local street who no one really knew much about. Um, but um, they were, uh, after a bit of persuasion, they allowed us to put a few planters on the garden and, and in their garden and we, we're starting to grow veg. Um, we're, um, uh, there's, there's, um, uh, we're quite an ethnically mixed uh, neighborhood and um, we're soon uh, someone someone's been in touch to start up a kind of walking group for women with a specific um, aim of uh, getting people from different backgrounds to go off and have a chat and get some exercise and that's just going to be for our street it's just for our neighbors um, but it's um, we're gonna um, try and get a little bit of funding for that and, and, and something like that and I'm also um, we're also launching a uh, an emergency fund where people can chip in through PayPal and um, if people are having a hard time financially they can um, um, come to one of us and you can get 50 quid no questions asked to tide you over till the next month 
or something like that. Um, we're all of these things are experiments and we're just kind of mucking our way around. And I cannot emphasize how much that we are just a group of neighbors trying to get on with stuff. And uh, that's happening on other streets in, our, in other places in our area. Um, but we're all organizing around our small local community because that feels right to us. It feels most comfortable. It's where you recognize people and you trust people with, I'm gonna give you 50 quid, no questions asked or, 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 or whatever else it is we're gonna do. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we're, that's what we're, that's what we're about. We're gonna continue this space. And I think it's interesting to think about it in the context of democracy and, and having these kind of conversations because that is increasingly happening. We're having a conversation about how can we make our street nicer and what do we need to do? What can we do together? And who do we need to go and bully? And it's normally the councillors. Um, like, how do we? Um, um, what What do we? You know, what 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 do we need to do together to achieve that? And we're starting to achieve more and more. Um, I think you know, if it ended tomorrow, we'd have done some fantastic stuff. But it won't. Um, it's going to keep going, and it's a It's a lovely forum. It's a really friendly forum, um, and increasingly, I think it's a powerful forum for people on our street who weren't previously talking and now we are talking and now we're going to get some stuff done. Um, so I think that's really, um, I hope that that gives a flavor for what we're doing. Um, and I'd like to say, it would be great to, to, to chat about um, what that might mean in the context of these slightly bigger questions about democracy and, and all of that kind of stuff. Brilliant. That was great, Jack, really helpful. Um, full of interesting details as well. Thank you, both of you. Um, okay, so we've got 20 minutes left. I noticed there was tons of things coming in the chat and I probably didn't. I noticed there, there was a call for Angela to say something. I think, was it from Warren or something? We, Angela, would you, I mean, if it's kind of like brief, I think you've got a really good overview of some of these things that are going on and some of the, maybe the journey from mutual aid to something more developed would you mind talking just for maybe a couple of minutes to set the scene a little bit and then let's see what other questions or points people want to have make is that okay yeah can do and i would just kind of just add, add on that it's been very much kind of the similar approach to what jack has just described but possibly a, a bigger area so initially it started off in my street and then we connected with other people who were doing their streets and we built up this network where there was some coverage on about 112 streets and that they were then tied together by a Facebook group of which there is 972 members. And, and we started by uh, taking very much, uh, we started community treasure mapping. So looking at what skills people had that they might like to share with others uh, in the community. Uh, right from the beginning, so uh, like Dillis, who had to isolate, wanted to talk to other people who were isolating. So rather than be seen as somebody who was just having food dropped out off, how could Dillis contribute? So so we started uh, very much in that way, and and then realised, like Jack did, that some people had shared passion. So we had a community garden, and now on Monday we're starting a. Uh, food pantry, so there was other people who were interested in food waste and, and food poverty. And then, I mean, the idea came from talking to Jack, actually, when he talked about his fund, but we've now grown, we've got 500 quid in a, a, a little uh, emergency fund for people can have up to 50 pound, no strings, uh, see how that goes, 12 pound over Christmas. And what started as 150 pound has like grown to 500 pound. And I think that's how we grow democracy. Because what, we, what we're seeing is that more and more people are wanting to get involved and, and are giving up and are saying, I'll do that. I'll get involved with this. I'll get involved. And we've started. So after Christmas, we're then going to start broadening our conversations around thinking about, you know, we, and we, we have already started. We, we kind of sat outside the post office uh, during lockdown and took a couple of chairs and just chatted to people who went to the post office around you know what are the strengths of the area and what would they be prepared to act on together what would they be prepared to get involved in so that's how the community garden kind of came about so we have started doing that but I, I think after Christmas we'll probably have some kind of fund that people will want to pay into because it's grown but people are feeling 
a real sense of belonging. So they're much more likely to get involved at different levels. So we're looking possibly at now widening out. There was like five in a core group and we have got a constitution, but the constitution is just about uh, uncovering gifts and connecting people and growing power. That's all we said that we're, you know, creating associations. That's what we're saying our purpose is. Uh, and we're now at this stage where we're going to widen that out and say who else wants to come in and get involved and, and look at like kind of the uh, uh, possibly uh, a community benefit society because people are already starting to have a conversation about oh what could we do with that pub and what could we do with that space over there and and so I think that's how that's how it grows so we, we you know I've been looking at whether. Uh, I think, you know, we've not decided yet as a community about what the structure will be, but there's something that's definitely fought and is going to grow. Brilliant. Thanks, Angela. Let's, I'm going to switch this to, I don't, I'm never quite clear who can see what, on, but I've switched it on my thing anyway to the gallery view so I can see everybody. Um, so would anybody... Like, so the question for 15 minutes, oh, Angela, come back. I just seen Sue has said, has anyone tried to get a credit union account? We did get a credit union account, but we found that it's been a real barrier because like, we, we tried to apply for some money with Forever Manchester for some benches in the garden. And because they don't do backs, then you can't pay into it. We've had to get another organisation to host it, but we have got a credit union account uh, uh, as, as our mutual aid. I just thought. Yeah, cool. So we can do that. You might spot a question that, that you might, might want to answer. But I suppose the big question hanging over this, which there is a commentary in, is, uh, and we started to get a sense from um, uh, all three speakers, really, of some of the challenges here about how we keep people engaged, what the right questions are, what the right structures are. Um, it's a very early stage of, of thinking and development, I suppose. And all, at the moment, since, you know, in, I, I noticed that, say, in my um, where my mum lives, which is Ludlow in Shropshire, a lot of the community activity, uh, the, the kind of mutual aid activity, was very quickly generated because it's a small place. And actually, the town, a lot of the problems we have in cities didn't seem to occur. The relationship between council, the voluntary sector, and neighbours seemed much less problematic. That may be a generalisation, but. When you take the structure, the bigger the structures get, then the harder all of this is. So we're effectively making up structures that, that seems to me like logically should exist, but just don't exist. And, the, and, and that raises all sorts of questions for us about, yeah, how to do this when, when the, the people at the centre have not got much interest in this really, other than rhetorical. Um, so I don't know, thoughts, questions, 15 minutes, uh, anybody wants to go, uh, you can put something in the chat to say you want to speak or I'll look at hands, turn your camera on or anybody. <laughs> or turn you, just unmute yourself and speak. Can I, can I ask a question, Simon? It's yes. Nick here. Um, I, I, I'm, my, my at the beginning, you talked about 140 odd neighbourhoods in Sheffield for a half a million population. Yeah. Uh, and Jack was talking about the power of 200 residents and, uh, and how mutual, mutual aid flourishes in that very hyper local. So I'm just, and then I asked a question about the jump between the hyper local to the sort of bigger structures you need for participatory democracy to, to work. I mean, if you're talking about a pub, it's not just a street, is it? How can we use this pub differently? Well, it's, it might be many streets, it might be a whole ward, or it might be. So, so that jump from a street hyperlocal to a neighborhood, which I guess you're talking about 50,000 population, 30 to 50,000, I don't know. How, how, how do you see making that jump, I suppose, is my, my interest and question. Yeah, no, for neighbourhood, I mean, I guess there is no answer to what a neighbourhood is, but actually in Sheffield, the neighbourhood would be about three or 4,000 people, and it would correspond, interestingly, to a primary school. That, uh, I, I, I only found this out accidentally, but ethnographically, people identify with 142 different neighbourhoods in Sheffield, and there are 140 primary schools in Sheffield. So I think there's a that correlation. Makes a lot more sense. Yeah, 
I think it's almost sense, but the structure of the health and care system uses, the public service system uses, is 30 to 50,000, isn't it? Yes, and I suppose, like in Sheffield, I would say those are good examples yeah. of broken systems. And what we've seen is those yeah. systems actually get more centralised, get more disconnected from their neighbourhoods. So if you break it down to GP, a GP or a social worker, you can start to make you can start to get back to something that I would consider to be close to a neighbourhood. Your point also is important that, I mean, when Cormac and I were looking at this earlier in the year, you know, a lot of the data from uh, other countries was reinforcing Jack's point that people organise best, actually. We, were, we weren't sure, it depends how big the streets are. I did some calculations with Sheffield, but a small street or a block or something like that is what what actually is... A kind of human engagement like a superhuman engagement in some way and then there is the neighborhood is a bit bigger than that so the neighborhood is a bunch of blocks isn't it and um, and then a, a ward as in civic governance terms is much much bigger than that normally containing three or four neighborhoods so we've got huge vacuums um, um but i'm interested in i suppose this is me but like how do how do you make this really engaging for people and human and bring to life citizenship? And then how do you call public services to account from that basis? Not the other way around. Like what's convenient for the system is the wrong question because they always redefine what's convenient around the latest round of cuts they've got to make or the uh, wage inequality that they've got to justify. <laughs> I mean, we found the Sheffield NHS has become now uh, the NHS for the whole of South Yorkshire, a bit of Nottinghamshire, to which now we have no, we've got no way of making that system accountable to us. Whereas really, why can't we have Sheffield Nether Edge, where I live, or, you know, Sheffield Broom Hill? And you know, why can't we have a conversation like that, which is a functional conversation about how does this work for us? Well, you know, like Jack says, you know, this, the streets, how do we talk to a council and stop cars racing down the street? So I, I don't know the answer, Nick, but I think we've got to get the almost the maths right at a really human level and start from that point of view and, and then start challenging the systems above to because there's huge gaps in many cities anyway and many other towns, I think. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant. Anybody you could happy to respond or anybody else want to come in? I'll, I'll just I'll just respond. I've got the advantage. I can't see anybody else on my screen except you, so you might have <laughs> old hands up. I can't see them. <laughs> so I'll just I think there's a lot of learning around around local area coordination um, as a concept, Simon, which is evidence based for many many years, and they yeah. use a around about a ten to twelve thousand population, and it's the way the public services, you know, the social worker or the the neighbourhood worker really gets to know the people and the assets in an area. And that seems to work around that size. So there's some evidence there to draw from, I think. Yeah, that's I'll right. And, and that local area coordination seems to be about equivalent to two neighbourhoods. Selva? Yeah, I was just saying um, our mutual aid group, we we actually, it's the whole of Berry that we we sort of look after. There must be a good, Oh, there's got to be in, it, in excess of 50,000 people. So how we do that is that we have 10 coordinators and we each have an area each. So that makes up the whole of, of Berry, and, and that has worked very well. And, and that's just the mutual aid group. You know, we've done that ourselves. Uh, and so, so it, it is possible. And within that, we found that neighborhoods have then come together as well. So it, so it does seem to, it, it can work. Brilliant, thanks Alva. So, that, that, so let me get that right. Is that like each coordinator is kind of covering 50,000? Yeah. No. No. It's 10, 10 coordinators covering 50,000. We each have an area each. About 5,000 each. And then we have our own volunteers. And and then we all get, so there is like, there's a, a WhatsApp group for all the coordinators and the call handlers. We then each have a WhatsApp group for our volunteers. And yeah. we just chat between and we, 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 you know, we use their coordinators chat and we solve problems that way. You know, it's not just, this is my area. We're not going to do anything else. It's very much, oh, what's the problem? 
this is what we need to do and and it's worked really well and it's completely voluntary as well you know there is no one paid at all it's, it's and it's worked well cool so that car your coordinators are corresponding to roughly what i'm calling a neighborhood which in in, in ancient athens was called a demi hence why angela and i have called the movement for neighborhood democracy demi move so a democrat that's a democratic unit so in ancient Athens, as well as meeting on a hill, tens of thousands of citizens, each neighborhood would make lots of decisions at a demi level. People would gather in their kind of effectively uh, big pubs or <laughs> public outside actually in Athens normally, but then, then they just make decisions. And, and that kind of is, it seems to me, I don't see why that's not feasible in the modern world, especially if you look at the technological capacities we have combined with the love of place that most of us have, I think. Yeah, and I, th I think we just kind of need to get back into practice of making sure decisions together through consensus and agreeing to disagree as well, don't we? You know, so we, we've just been doing like bits of that through our group, you know, because we've been so divisive over the last few years, haven't we? About uh, in communities, particularly in some parts of Wigan depended upon, you know, with 67% Brexit vote and we had a, a ward that turned from, you know, our whole uh, MP area that turned from uh, blue to red. So there was a lot of families that wouldn't speak to each other. <laughs> so getting to speak to each other again is like the first bit of democracy really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think, and, and like, I think it seems really clear that if we just replicate the kind of party structures and an issue-based approaches that uh, that people associate with politics will kill it. Like so, represent. Like again, sorry, I go on about Athens a lot, but for Athenians, what we call representational democracy, they did said was not democracy. Like if you vote for somebody, you're basically saying there's somebody better than us who can make decisions for us. So that so it was banned. Really, they used it very, very, very rarely, basically for generals for the army. <laughs> which was meant to be an extreme circumstance. So they didn't do representational democracy. So Camille, I think I saw Camille's hand wave. Yeah, thanks for um, this discussion's really interesting. Um, but I was just interested in what you said there about um, issue issue based kind of work and, and that not being a focus. Um, because for some of the systemic issues that these mutual aid groups are experiencing across um, their different areas, um, uniting around an issue for a priority period of time might be a way to get traction on that issue um, and to get decision makers to be able to listen to that um, and, to, and to bring the power of lived experience from those communities um, into that space. Um, that's kind of the work that I do um, and I'd be interested in talking to anyone who's interested in doing that, basically. Camille, who, tell us who you are and where you're from then. Sure, hi. Um, I am Camille and I am from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. So we are a big um, anti-poverty uh, social change organisation. And my role is a new one. Um, uh, basically, I started in uh, August this year and uh, we have long held a kind of participatory approach to um, policy making and um, ensuring that the voices of people with lived experience of poverty and and that can be in and of itself a, a divisive word because um, some people are very proud of where they come from and um, what has happened in their communities um, and uh, but anyway if you have lived experience of injustice um, the um, the idea is that if you want to my job is to amp help amplify those voices. So to to work with you on an issue that you're trying to get traction on in a local community or at a national level. Um, so it's it's sitting alongside those groups. It's not big JRF over here campaigning on um, work, housing, social security. It's um, it's going okay. What are the poverty related issues that are related to the work that you're doing, and how can um, how might we, um, how might I support you in doing that? Um, is it linking you up with other um, networks of people that are perhaps uh, experiencing the same issues? Is it, you know, 
bespoke sort of training and guidance? Um, is it, you know, just bouncing ideas off each other to kind of um, get to get to some of that systemic change or best practice in a local area? And that's kind of what my job is designed to know. And it's brand new. So I'm just kind of scoping out groups that are working on those sorts of things. I, I, so I'm going to, so by issue, I meant not partisan ideological, but the, but just to, as a footnote, and Toby here from the UBI Lab Network is on, if you want an issue, Camille, to take back to JRF, why are they opposing basic income persistently, given that it's a grassroots movement for basic income rooted in communities? Just, it's just my, that would be my thoughts, but... Uh, Selva. Yeah, that's fair. It's it's not about it's not about JRF. Like we will continue to campaign on the policy issues that we campaign on, but it's about going. Okay, well, what resources exist within a community, um, and if there yeah. is a campaign around GBI, um, and they need support, then I'm happy to be put in touch with anyone. There's who a huge one. Just that. yeah, get in touch. Yeah, so I'll put my email in the thing if you like. But Selva, sorry. Yeah, exactly the same thing. I've put my email into the chat, Camille, because the organisation that I work with, um, the Elephant's Trail, um, is made up of people with lived experience, all of us. So that is in and that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, same. So it'd be lovely to have a chat with you. So any other thoughts or questions? That was, we've got like two minutes left now, so this would have to be a really... Short, sharp one. Maybe, maybe we don't need to do that on that. Uh, so Camille's offering to help. Um, I'm going to put my uh, the UBI Lab Network, Camille. If you've not come across it, um, we've got 35 labs um, rooted in communities. Um, it's been growing for some time. Um, JRF seems still opposed to it, but for some reason I don't quite understand. Um, and uh, right. So I'm going to just thank you and then we can.